Pink Floyd is one of the best-selling bands of all time, with their album, Dark Side of the Moon, being on the Billboard Top 200 for a total of over 950 weeks, selling over 24.4 million copies. The band's elaborate stage shows were innovative for the time, using dazzling light shows and a large circular screen with projections on the screen synced to music. These projections would include various animated segments, most of which would be animated by Ian Ames, Ames worked on the animations for one of these days in the iconic animation for the Dark Side of the Moon's time. However, after seeing the short, a long drawn out trip in 1974, the band would hire political cartoonist Gerald Scarf as their main animator going forward. He worked on animations for Wish You Were Here, various scrapped concepts for animals, and most famously, The Wall. While the Dark Side of the Moon and the Wish You Were Here projections were later released as part of their respective immersion box sets in 2012, the Wall's animations, perhaps the most extravagant of these, still haven't gotten a proper release. What are they? Why is that? These are the Lost Pink Floyd animations. This video is sponsored by my Fiverr account. Bring your videos up to the highest quality possible with my restoration services, starting at only $5. Hit the link in the description or wait till the end of the video to learn more. Before we start, I'd like to thank Mr. Carl's Films one also known as Gunty, for the help with the research and writing of this video. Without him, this video wouldn't be nearly as comprehensive. The Wall is a massively influential rock opera released in 1979. It tells the story of a man named Pink, who builds a mental wall around himself due to trauma throughout his life. In the live-action performance of The Wall during the first half of the show, a physical wall would be built in front of the band, with projections being shown on a circular screen at center stage. During the second half of the show, they would use the wall itself as a screen, projecting animations to not work onto it using three 4x3 35mm film projectors, similar to the 1927 epic Napoleon, before toppling it down for the finale. Gerald Scarf and his team worked on three main sequences of the show, which were What Shall We Do Now, Waiting for the Worms, and The Trial. He would also make a segment for Goodbye Blue Sky later on using storyboards that would be shown during the 1981 shows. What Shall We Do Now was made up of two different segments, one at the beginning of the song, and another one near the end during the rock portion. The first segment shows the night sky before fading into the famous flower sequence. It then fades out as the band starts singing, then during the rock portion it comes back showing the female flower eating the male flower before flying off into the distance. The Waiting for the Worms projection starts with stock footage of the Union Jack. It then fades into the hammers standing on the hill as darkness rains down upon the town, showing empty playgrounds left behind. From there the hammers invade with the now famous Hammer March. The trial is the grand finale of the show, and it has Pink having to confront the people from his life, the teacher, his wife, and his mother, before the judge sentences him to tear down the wall, with a member of the jury telling the judge to shit on Pink. As the wall falls down, a slideshow of various frames are flashed on screen, Alongside the main animated sequences, there would also be still projections for Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, Nobody Home, Vera, Bring the Boys Back Home, and both versions of In the Flesh. However, instead of full animation, these would range from slideshows to still pictures to video collages. In the Flesh 1 featured the Cross Hammers logo on the screen. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 showed various artworks of the teacher. Nobody Home briefly showed television clips at the start. Vera had three separate screens showing various photos of Pink Floyd and Vera Lynn. Bring the Boys Back Home shows not only a famous image from World War II, but also a nightmarish set of flashing images, all of which being artwork drawn by Gerald Scarf. And finally, In the Flesh 2 showed the Cross Hammers logo on opposite sides of the wall, and three targets spinning across the wall. Now the second run of shows at Earl's Court in June 1981 were scheduled to be filmed for use in an adaptation of the wall scheduled for 1982. You would think these animations would be fully included as they were essential part of the show and the storytelling, however the film didn't turn out exactly as planned.
After a few test filmings and videotape during the 1980 shows, the band decided to film the June 1981 shows on a wide 70mm film. However, the concerts were simply too dark, even after an attempt to light the audience using floodlights which got a sour reaction from many in attendance. Much of the footage was deemed as useless and muddy, so all the footage that was shot for the film had to be scrapped as the film moved over to a more traditional production instead of a concert film, akin to Ken Russell's adaptation of The Who's Tommy. From there came the question of what to do with the animations. The main problem with including them in the movie was the aspect ratio as the film was being made in ultra wide anamorphic, meaning an aspect ratio of 2.35 to 1, while the animations for the most part were done in 4x3. So the decision was made to re-photograph many of the animations to fit the wider aspect ratio. However, there are two major problems with this. One was the main background for the trial sequence, which also served as the original gatefold artwork for the album, was stolen while it was on display at Earl's Court in 1980, alongside nine other artworks made for the album and tour, which were marked as a £30,000 loss in 1980. The pieces stolen all remain missing to this day. Gerald Scarf said it's probably hanging on some dodgy fan's bedroom wall in his book, Making of the Wall. The second problem was that the backgrounds and finished animation that they did have were simply not wide enough to fill the aspect ratio of the film, so new backgrounds had to be drawn. The only downside is that these backgrounds were generally inferior when compared to the original backgrounds that were used for the tour. They were close enough so they used the new ones as replacements. Along with that, a good portion of the animations were edited down, altered, or cut. However, I'll leave this part of the video to my guest, Mr. Kyle's Film 1, also known as Gunty. Take it away. Thank you, Note. To start with, all of the still projections for songs like Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 in both versions of In the Flesh were cut entirely. Pretty simple change to start with. Goodbye Blue Sky would get the best out of these changes in edits, oddly enough, being upgraded from just storyboards to a full animation, which is now regarded as one of the best sequences from the Wall film, second only to the next sequence being covered. What Shall We Do Now was combined into one segment, losing about 10 seconds of animation. However, the sequence as a whole was extended, and now allowing for the inclusion of the fully animated segment filling in the empty spaces. Though, all jokes aside, the sequence was a nightmare to get done on time. According to Scarf, each frame took approximately 24 hours to do, and that Jill and Mike, two of the key animators, remember they worked for 36 hours flat out on the flowers to get them ready for the film in time. Vera and Bring the Boys Back Home got all of their animations and stills entirely cut, now being replaced with live actors on a set as a part of one of Pink's psychosis-induced flashbacks. Waiting for the Worms got the worst treatment out of all of these, with two major sequences showing footage of the Union Jack and Hammers atop a hill overlooking a town being completely cut, leaving only the marching hammers and reusing pieces of animation for both Shine On You Crazy Diamond Parts 1-5 through 5 and What Shall We Do Now, alongside live action sequences of skinheads causing chaos in a small town. The most startling of the changes out of this sequence were the hammers themselves, which, to put it simply, were butchered from their original tour versions. In his Making of Pink Floyd's The Wall book, Scarf states, The hammers, for example, had to be adapted for a wider screen and one desolate animator was driven half mad adding further ranks of marching hammers alongside the existing ones. On top of this, as you can see on screen, the entire thing was cropped and stretched to hell, and it doesn't look nearly as impactful as its tour counterpart. However, there is one saving grace. The original marching animation of the Hammers was featured in the Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 music video. You can actually view this music video on YouTube, and whenever you're watching it, just remember that you're watching the original Hammer animations from the tour in motion. The trial made it past relatively unscathed, with just three shots cut out in total. These shots were a door opening from Pink's perspective at the start, a complicated panning shot that was separated into three separate shots, though the animation itself is still intact, and most notably an entire character, affectionately known by many as Go On Judge. The tear down the wall sequence is replaced with a montage of chaos from the film, along with using some of the film's deleted scenes and b-roll footage. As of the recording of this video, the film is the closest thing to an official release for any of the projections and animations, other than clips from various documentaries. Now, before I begin this segment, I would like to mention that there will be a second part to this video on my channel in which I take a deep dive into every single projection change between versions of The Wall. 
Alan Parker's wall film wouldn't contain the only edited versions of these sequences. Over the years, four different variants have been produced. These include the original tour projections from 1980 to 1981, the wall film edits from 1982, the Berlin 1990 show, and the Roger Waters wall tour from 2010 to 2013. We've covered the first two, so let's take a look into the others and how they utilized or even removed the lost pieces. For the Berlin 1990 show, Goodbye Blue Sky and What Shall We Do Now used slightly modified versions of their film edits. Vera was updated to show World War II soldiers from every country that participated instead of the collage of images used on the original tour. Bring the Boys Back Home was massively overhauled, showing the name of the song across the wall and artwork depicting the Normandy American Cemetery, alongside cutting the nightmarish flashes of art by Scarf. Waiting for the Worms and The Trial are using slightly modified versions of the original tour projections rather than the movie edits, which is an odd choice given that some of the other bits of animation in the show are using their movie versions. The Waiting for the Worms sequence is almost completely intact, and the same can be said for the trial sequence. The only edit for the trial being that during the Tear Down the Wall sequence, it fades to Berlin Wall graffiti instead of the original swirling animation towards the end. As an added note, Go On Judge also made an appearance in this show, though he's only actually seen via rehearsal footage. Overall, the Berlin projections are pretty faithful to the original shows, and it even has released the most footage, with a good portion of the original reels being included on the 2003 DVD release of Live in Berlin. This release also contains a full cut of the Waiting for the Worms sequence alongside the middle projector for the judges section of the trial. Sadly, it has Berlin Wall graffiti plastered over it and seems to be recorded off of a monitor within the venue, so it isn't any useful for restoration. Now, the Roger Waters wall tour is where things get really weird. New projections were made for almost every song, which is fine, but we'll cover those differences and the newer work in the second part, as previously mentioned. For now, let's stick to the lost bits. Goodbye Blue Sky was completely redone, leaving none of the original animation by Gerald Scarf, instead replacing it with a CGI animated sequence, which is criticism for wars that are fought only for corporate monetary gain and nothing else. Scarf commented on this in his Making of the Wall book as well, in which he states, Roger wanted to broaden his anti-war stance to include all wars, not just the Second World War, and to that end, Sean is remaking the whole sequence. I was sad about this too because I think that Goodbye Blue Sky is perhaps one of the best pieces of animation in the wall. However, it must go in order to broaden the subject matter. For What Shall We Do Now, which shows the main buds on the circular screen and stems across the wall, which is a cool idea and concept. However, for the rest of the sequence, they took the movie version, stretched it across the incomplete wall, and merged it with the circular screen, which just looks bad. Also, during the final morphing sequence, they slowed down the footage. This was because the animation that was made for the film abruptly cuts off, so this causes it to just be completely offbeat and not work well with the ending of the song. Vera is a collage of videos of soldiers returning from war to see their families, which I actually think is a great modern touch and adds a lot of emotional depth to this particular song. However, it is still missing the original images. Bring the Boys Back Home shows pictures of various war-stricken areas, alongside a famous quote from FDR, but is again missing the scarf artwork from the original. Waiting for the Worms has the cut Hammers on the Hill sequence restored to fit on the larger wall, but still has the Union Jack scene entirely cut. However, what I don't like are the hammers themselves. This tour used a new set of marching animations which was done using CGI, which, to be honest, looks bad and a little off-model when compared to the originals. Now, the trial is where it gets really edit-heavy, so much of the sequence will be covered in part two. There's all sorts of cropping issues, new sections of animation, extended backgrounds, partially restored versions of the original tour animations, the works. Now, the most prominent lost piece that appears in the sequence is no other than Go On Judge, who was last seen in the Berlin 1990 show. However, the sequence has been mirrored and partially cropped by bricks, situated in a tiny hole in the wall as his iconic quote is spread across the wall, which a lot of videographers decide to focus on the quote and not the moving character for some reason. I mean, seriously, look at this. How is it that everyone decides to look at the words instead of the moving character? It makes absolutely no sense. 
The tear down the wall sequence is partially restored, but is insanely zoomed in and has all of the original character flashes missing, alongside having new projections laid over top of it. As stated before, the differences are all so vast and so many that they'll have to be covered in part two. Overall, the Roger Waters tour projections are heavily redone and only slightly resemble the originals. And as someone who is an avid fan of this version of the wall, and to many, an apologist, I do feel as if the animations should have been treated a lot better with modern technology. If you wish to see every change of the projections across all of these versions of the wall, you can check out the sequel video on my channel, Mr. Kyle's Films 1. Thank you for allowing me to partake note, but now I must furiously work on the sequel. These videos don't make themselves, you know. Take care everyone, and enjoy the rest of the video. Thank you so much to Mr. Kyle's Films 1 for your help. Now onto the few limited releases. Over time, most of the original projections Pink Floyd have used have been released over the years in their respective box sets, with Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here projections being released on their respective immersion sets, and the rest being released on the early years and the later years, with the exception of The Wall. The Wall did get an immersion set, however, without a Blu-ray full of live footage, original projections, and a 5.1 mix, for The Wall set there was only a DVD that had the Another Brick in a Wall Part 2 music video, which I should mention was already included on the Wall movie DVD, a documentary called Behind the Wall, which was originally made in 2000 but is now in the wrong aspect ratio, a whole 90 seconds of live footage, an interview with Gerald Scarf, and that's it. No live show, no projections, nothing. The original projections are technically online, however they are from low quality VHS tapes that are just bootlegs of the wall 1980 shows, as you can guess that is not ideal. A few direct feed clips and other high resolution clips are included in the behind the wall documentary along with an episode of Seven Ages of Rock in 2007, the Live in Berlin 2003 documentary and a few clips and documentary made for Roger Waters' wall tour. Because the Rogers wall projections use the original sequences in high definition, we know that they still do exist and have already been scanned and restored. According to Comfortably Numb, A History of the Wall 1978-1981 by Vernon Hinch and Richard Mahon, in 2003 all the wall films in Roger Waters' possession were documented and archived for Waters by Nick Thompson, a film editor who worked with Waters on his solo live tours. We can only assume that the animations are included with this, as they are on the 2003 Berlin DVD as previously mentioned. The only real issue now is releasing them. And the real problem with that is that Creative Control of the Wall has been owned by Roger Waters since 1987. For those unaware, Roger split from Pink Floyd in 1985 and has since been on and off bad terms with the memories ever since. The band stuff from after Roger's departure have gotten much better releases such as the Delicate Sound of Thunder and Pulse live show recordings, along with the full screen films for those tours being released in their respective DVDs and later in HD with the later years set. My only guess is that it'd have to be Roger or Scarf or someone involved doesn't want to release them. Let's be honest, it's, it's, it's Roger. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to watch these original animations along with this incredible rock spectacle in HD on a future release. Thank you to everyone for watching this. This has been a massive project, and I'd like to especially thank Mr. Kyle's Films 1 for the help of the writing and researching for this video, as well as providing some voiceovers. Like he said, you could check out the second part of this video on his channel. However, make sure to subscribe before you do, and have a nice day.